Well, I appreciate I appreciate everybody coming out uh, for for this uh, for this presentation. Yeah, if you need an app, don't don't hesitate. It's not going to bother me a bit. Is, is the light good for you? It is. It's perfect. I got I got it made. Uh, to uh, echo what John's saying, uh, just real quick, what we're trying to do with the dues, we don't pay any local speakers. I don't get paid. Don't expect to get paid, and would turn it down if I did. But we do like to get people from outside the area to come. And a lot of times, if you get a really good speaker, they may have to. We may have to put them up. And so that's what that money goes for is, is, is buy a hotel room. The other thing we'd like to do, if we, if we grow the organization big enough, what we'd like to do is take some of the money and support the Most Shoals National Heritage Area in establishing a Civil War trail. So that's the that's two goals with the dues. This is that pretty simple. There's really nothing else, right, John? All right, so we're going to talk about uh, uh, a few people here. Uh, the... Major Lamar Fontaine is captured when the skirmish. And we're also going to talk about a tombstone, which is uh, the tombstones there on the right. And we'll get to that at the end. And so it'll be a little bit of a switch of the path, but, but we'll tie them together in the middle. Uh, Lamar Fontaine, that's an older picture of him. Uh, he was the, he might have been the celebrity of the Civil War. Okay, and you'll see that as I go through and talk about this uh, a little bit. So, with no further ado, we'll just get started. Okay, Lamar Fontaine, according to him, was born on October 10th, 1829. We'll find out later that he might have been born October 11th, 1841. Now, that's a pretty big difference in ages, but... Uh, I mean dates, but we'll we'll talk about that. He did die on uh, October first, uh, nineteen twenty-one. After the Civil War, and we're going to cover Fontaine's life after the Civil War first because it's kind of anticlimactic to get to it later. So I'm going to hit it now. He settled in the village of Lyon in uh, Cahoma County, Mississippi, where he's living as a civil engineer. He's a very sharp guy, uh, as we'll see. Uh, helping build the levees on the Mississippi and doing surveying and mapping for many local communities. He earned a nationwide reputation full of, of telling stories that were uh, fascinating, if not always believable. His name became synonymous across the country with exaggeration. He might make Biden and Trump look like uh, poster boys for telling the truth. One paper noted that the story they were telling was no Lamar Fontaine tale. He became a celebrity during the Civil War, and so he went to a lot of these Confederate reunions. People would look for him, and one guy remembered, he said, hey, I went there, and I said, Where, where's Lamar Fontaine? The guy told him, said, look for the crowd. That's where he's going to be. So um, he was also a practical joker. Uh, after the war, he visited the governor, the, uh, the first Republican governor of Mississippi. He bet him he could kill a black squirrel that he saw near the governor's roadside gate. Now, this is 300 yards from the porch. And the governor, of course, said, I can't see no black squirrel from here. How in the world are you going to kill him? And he, there's not even one out there. And he said, he said, let me, he said, I'll tell you what, I can kill that black squirrel from right here. We don't even have to prove my markmanship. And so the governor, them jaw, and governor finally says, I'll bet you $10 you can't kill a squirrel that the governor couldn't even see. Well, Lamar took aim, pulled the trigger, and then they had uh, one of the governor's uh, aides drive down the 300 yards, and sure enough, there was a black squirrel at the gate, dead. And, uh, of course, Lamar Fontaine didn't tell the governor he'd shot the squirrel on the way in and threw him by the tree. <laughs> Um, so. The Fontaine family was originally from Virginia, and Lamar's grandfather, Patrick Henry Fontaine, was a grandson of the Virginian Patrick Henry. So he's got some lineage. Uh, the Fontaines were Huguenots. That's where they came from. Uh, he gave, uh, his father gave, I mean, his grandfather gave the family Mississippi roots by establishing a plantation near Pontotoc. Uh, Lamar Fontaine himself was born in Texas, stating he was the first male child born, born in the Austin colony. Lamar's father, the Reverend Edward Fontaine, had migrated to Texas from Mississippi, and the Fontaines, though, would return back to Mississippi just prior to the Civil War. Fontaine would state, I was born in Captain John Christman's tent on Lab Lab 
Labrador Prairie on the headwaters of the Ugua River near where the small village of Gay Hill was afterward built in what is now Washington County, Texas on the 10th of October, 1829. When he was about three years of age, a old German general came into his camp. He had been part of the Polish army and according to Fontaine, he had been exiled. He would become Fontaine's personal teacher. The guy was uh, taught him Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, and he also taught him how to box, wrestle, fence with both foil and saber, and how to ride, shoot a rifle and a pistol where he, he according to Fontaine, he became expert shot. And they went on many a long ride or prairies on his shoulders in search of deer, turkeys, and other game. All this happened, and oh yeah, he was expert in mathematics. All this happened before the age of 10. Just before my 10th birthday, my old friend passed into the great beyond and left a void in my life, my first great sorrow. Fontaine got a new teacher, a stern disciplinarian. He caught the teacher later after a beating he had took from him. And the teacher was climbing out of the hollow where he had done the deed and he caught him with a well-aimed stone uh, busting his forehead and giving him a slight concussion. Of course, that didn't go over well with Fontaine's father and he got spanked for that pretty seriously from his dad. Uh, he felt like none of this was deserved and so Fontaine decided that just after he was 10 years old that he would go live with the Indians. And the reason he decided that, he came upon a couple of Comanches. And when he did, he, they, he wasn't sure what he was going to do. And he just said, uh, they said, how do? And he said, I'm going with y'all, more or less. And he took off. So he would go with the Comanches and he learned the nomadic life, wearing little of nothing. He amazed the Indian chieftain uh, with well-aimed rifle shots that immediately dropped deer or buffalo in their tracks. And this amazed the Indians, according to Fontaine, and he became the star of the community. He said he, they traveled from the Rio Grande to the Black Hills. That fitted him for hardships and powers of endurance that would serve him well later in life. Again, according to Lamar. When he left the Indians, he decided he was going to leave and go back home. This is after three or four years. They said, you can go home, but you will have to walk. And according to Lamar, he walked 750 miles to get back to Texas. He said uh, he didn't do well adjusting to civilized life when he got back home. Uh, he had another incident with a teacher. And to escape from this school, which was near the coast, he got on a sailing ship that was going to Galveston. And there he decided the naval life wasn't so bad a thing. So his dad talked to him when he got back, said, you don't have to go back to school. Well, We'll figure something out. And he said a few months later, they headed off to Pensacola where he jumped into a ship that his dad put him on. And the next thing Mr. Fontaine said is, I'm out in the ocean and I'm on a ship with my distant cousin, Lieutenant Mari, uh, I mean Fontaine Mari. I'm sorry, let me get his name right. Uh, Lieutenant Matthew Fontaine Fari. So distant cousin, uh, this guy was known as the... Uh, Pathfinder of the Seas. He was considered a father of mo uh, modern oceanography. And so Fontaine said, next thing I know, they're in Greenland. And they're exploring the Arctic Ocean and doing all that stuff. And he said, after uh, spending the winter there, he didn't ever want to go back to the Arctic again. So spent a winter there. He uh, comes back uh, to Pensacola or Mobile in, at, around 1847. And he gets on another ship. And this is a U.S. naval ship. Now, he, now, he doesn't have a U.S. Navy record, so he must have just, just joined up. He said he ends up uh, firing on Veracruz at the start of the invasion of Mexico City by American forces. But the next thing he said, we were off to Japan, and he was with Matthew Perry Squadron. This is all before he's 16 years old. So he's, he's had, according to him, quite a life. Uh, From there, he... Uh, Spends some time in Japan. He sees the, goes over in China, sees the Great Wall, crosses the Himalayas into India. He eventually reaches Africa and the Nile and on to the Holy Land. 
somehow in the middle of, of saying all this, oh yeah, I did get back to Texas in 1849, but he didn't really explain how he did that. But he, he did have some things going on there. Uh, he eventually gets back to Texas in 1855 where his mother dies. This matches up with, with the record. It occurs in July 1855. He then sails to South America, involved in exploration there, and then he returns to Texas in 1859 for a short time. Um, and I missed out one important bit. He did, in the middle of going, before he was, when he was in the Holy Land, and before he got back to Texas, he went and fought in the Crimea War as, for the Russians. In December 1860, while he was in South America, he learned that Abraham Lincoln had been elected president of the United States, and he said it was time to go home. Like I said, Biden and Trump don't have nothing on this guy. Uh, uh, he joined the 10th Mississippi Infantry at Pensacola. Uh, he transferred to his father's uh, regiment, the 18th Mississippi, on June 18, 1861, and settled his pay, uh, this document on the left, his captain wrote that he was born in 1840 in the state of Texas, and he was aged 20 years, five feet nine and a fourth inches high. I thought that was interesting that he wanted to give him no more credit than credit was due. Dark complexion, dark eyes and hair, and by profession, a student of medicine. And he was enlisted by Captain R.A. Smith at Jackson, Mississippi on the 27th day of March, 1861. So the narrative, we got a little bit of a conflict. You know, that pretty much t tells me that everything he has written in his book to this point probably wasn't true. There might have been some things that were in there that were accurate, but there probably a lot of stuff that was embellishments. Lamar's, the, when he transferred to the, to the 18th from the 10th, Lamar Fontaine's father was the captain of his company, and he, at the Battle of Manassas, uh, Lamar was badly injured. One of the many wounds he would receive, not as many as he said, but many, one of the many wounds he did get. And he was hit hurt in the foot. Uh, his father was mentioned by General Beauregard for gallantry, uh, emeritus service during the battle. He had played a key role in uh, winning that fight. Uh, and that is in the official records. On the 6th of August, he was on picket duty with a fellow soldier named Moore to him. They called a truce uh, with the soldiers across the river to exchange papers. That night, the truce was broken, according to Fontaine, when his friend is shot and killed. Uh, Fontaine goes into great details about this incident in his memoir, and it's his basis for claiming uh, that he wrote All Quiet on the Potomac tonight. Now, he's always named, according to him, All Quiet on the Potomac. In uh, November 30th, 1861, the Harper's Weekly published a poem called The Picket Guard. And The Picket Guard uh, was, was later discovered to be by, according to them, Ethel Lynn Beers, somebody different. This dispute over who wrote it went on for a long time. Uh, Southerners would claim Fontaine wrote it. Uh, but I think most scholars now agree that um, it was written by the lady from the north. Uh, according to Fontaine, he had his poem copied and distributed, and that there were so many copies that that's how it got to Harper's Weekly. Somebody just submitted it into the papers. It was later set to music, and it was one of the most popular songs of the war. Let's see if this thing will play.
black, his face dark and grim, grows gentle with memories tender. As he mutters a prayer for the children asleep, and their mother may heaven defend her. The moon seems to shine as brightly as then, at night when the long years unspoken crept up to his lips and with long word vows were pledged to be ever unbroken. All right, that's not all of it. That's I cut it halfway off. So, <laughs> so you could, this is like I said, it was a very popular song for the time period. At some point, due to his first wound and the request of his father, uh, Lamar Fontaine was transferred to the Sixth Virginia Cavalry. Uh, basically, the foot wound made it difficult for him to march. Uh, he serves with Jackson in the Valley. There's no lack of description of, of action in his soldiering. So, you know, it's just, wow, 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 if you're reading it and you believe it's all true. He's, he's already led a lifetime, uh, you know, and so now it's his second one. In one fight on June 20th, 1862, fate would catch up with him. Uh, he's severely wounded in a charge. His thigh and collarbones are both broken. He's temporarily paralyzed. Uh, his wounds cause him basically, his right leg would stay paralyzed. His wounds basically call him to require crutches for the rest of his life. Uh, but according to Fontaine, he sticks around the army. Jackson, General Stonewall Jackson says, hey, just come to my camp. You stay around, we'll figure out something you can do. That's where he shows uh, Jackson what a good shot he is. And uh, he describes one fight in which he's shooting Yankees using a Whitworth rifle at 600 yards. So one day he's with Jackson and Jackson points out a battery of Union gunners that are causing havoc and Fontaine goes to shoot him. And after he shot 20 rounds, he says General Lee rides up, watches him shoot the rest of his 60 round cartridge box. He would relate this later. He said, at the 40th shot witnessed by General Lee and the 60th I had fired from my position, my ammunition gave out. And so I announced. The general glanced at his watch and said, you say you have fired 60 shots from your Whitworth rifle without a miss. I replied, yes, sir. Why, you have not been an hour at it said General Lee. Looking straight into Fontaine's eyes, he asked, Young man, don't your conscience hurt you? For what, General? said Fontaine. Lee replied, For shooting so many of those people. Of course, Lee never could call them Yankees or, or whatever. He would always call them those people. And Fontaine would say, I asked him if he'd ever shot a rattlesnake. He replied that he had, asked him if his conscience hurt him for that. <coughs> so you can see he, he didn't like Yankees as you would see through the book. Not long after this incident, his father would write the Secretary of War. This is September 30th, 1862. Sir, I've had my oldest son, Lamar Fontaine, educated from childhood in the profession of arms. He had the promise of an appointment of cadet at West Point at the time of disruption of U.S. government. I attended him for the Corps Engineers. I directed his early studies with a reference to that object, but his life in Texas and subsequent experience qualify him better for the cavalry services. I wish him appointed to be a first lieutenant or second lieutenant of cavalry. You, must, you will find that he's well qualified for any cavalry command. He was born in Washington County, Texas, October 11th, 1841. So again, now his own father's disputed his date. He draws well, paints well, and he's a good mathematician. Knows Latin, Greek, and French. Understands Spanish. As a horseman and swordsman and marksman with a rifle and pistol, he has but few superiors. So his dad, so he's a good shot. He's knowledge about ancient modern history. And he, and he talked about his early military career. So when you hear all that, you realize that Fontaine, some of the stuff Fontaine is saying is probably accurate, but he's embellishing everything that occurs, okay? Fontaine, during this time, as he writes afterwards, he's staying in the war, uh, staying around the Confederate Army in North Virginia. He's involved in the fights at Second Manassas, Antietam, Fredericksburg, and Chancellorsville. And he's the guy 
that actually show Jackson the route to get around the Union flanks at Chancellorsville. So, you know, we've missed that part in history somehow. However, the guy on the left, uh, you know, Fontaine's father is the guy on the right. I probably should have mentioned that earlier. But the guy on the left there is General Richard Ewell. General Ewell would write in the, uh, a communication that made it in the official records. He would say, a fine parrot piece abandoned within four, four miles of Winchester was brought off within sight of the enemy's pickets by Privates Fontaine and Moore. Now, if you remember, Moore's dead now, but, but Moore apparently has been able to reconstitute of course, you remember because Fontaine had said he was the picket that got killed. Using two plow horses from a neighboring field brought it back to Front Royal, a piece of cool, daring, hard to match. So, you know, unfortunately for Fontaine, if he just wrote the truth, we'd still be amazed, but, but, but that wasn't enough for him. About this time, he starts making it in the newspapers. I mean, making it all the time. If you got a newspaper.com account, you can find him easier than you can find Robert E. Lee almost, okay? This is a Fayetteville newspaper dated Thursday, January 15th, 1863, detailing some of his exploits and his claim poem. But note that his poem has the tide of All Quiet on the Potomac tonight. So even early on, he has claimed that title. And it isn't until later that year that it's put to music with that title. That, I still find that interesting. After Chancellorsville, Fontaine is back in Mississippi. A dis, uh, he's, he's a discharged soldier. Right. Perhaps he was probably there sooner uh, than he wanted to let us know based on his second wounds. But he's, he left a, the left newspaper clipping is from the Selma Dispatch just prior to the surrender of Vicksburg. Fontaine had carried caps and a dispatch to General Pemberton besieged in the city. Later escaped from Vicksburg with his dispatch back to General Johnson. And in the official records, Pemberton would note Fontaine in his report stating, my thanks are also due to the following officers and men who rendered valuable service in transmitting dispatches through the enemy's lines to and from General Johnson. And he notes Lamar Fontaine, a discharged soldier. The story that Fontaine tells about getting into Vicksburg and getting out is amazing. I mean, if you were just writing a novel, it's a great story. So if you, if you do read his book, just read it and just say, hey, I'm not going to believe most of what I read, but it's going to be a good story. I mean, James Bond didn't have nothing. If there was a James Bond Civil War, they wouldn't have had nothing on Lamar Fontaine. He, he talks about staring down a cotton mouth for a page and a half. Now, I mean, how, could, how in the world could anybody in their right mind write a whole page and a half about how to stare down a cotton mouth? from a foot away, eyeball to eyeball. So for sure now he's a celebrity. He's given the rank of major because of his exploits around Vicksburg, put back in the service, and he's assigned, sent to General Roddy to serve as an aide. From there, he steals without firing a shot several wagons near Iuka, including medical stores. Now this is what I find, you know, because I know a little bit about the history here, this event actually did happen. And it happened earlier in the war but this is where Fontaine, here's a story. You can see him at a campsite, gets there, and they talk about stealing this medical uh, wagon. And the next thing you know, Fontaine feels like he was there doing it himself. He also, from these captured supplies during that time, uh, he said, states that he sent women's items from there, the sutler's wagons, to his two female cousins living nearby, one of Miss Ella Winston and the other Miss Kate Armstead. Now, the Winston plantation is the one, I believe it's the Carbert... Uh, uh, Belmont. So, so that's the Winslet that he knows, and apparently he's distant relatives to those folks. He says, but you know, he's not over there at Chickamauga and Chattanooga's going on, so, so he got dispatches to go over there, and he just so happened to be over there during both of those battles and participate in both of those. Okay. So finally, he gets back to Tuscumbia and he's given a, a dangerous mission go up into ten Middle Tennessee and gather intelligence. And guess what? The Staunton, Virginia paper on Tuesday, February 9th, 1864, announced that Lamar Fontaine had been captured. And so now that's where we're headed to next, the middle part of this presentation, the capture of Lamar Fontaine and the skirmish, and then that gets us into the third part.
which won't have any Lamar Fontaine in it. So here we go. Fontaine is captured. Uh, I'm sorry, before we get to the third part, let's talk a little bit. Let's get from there to the end of the Civil War, and then we'll come back. He's captured. Uh, he says he escaped and participated in the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse, and then re wounded there, recaptured. I don't find any record of that occurring. It, it, matter of fact, some of his prison records said he was captured at uh, Chickamauga, so records aren't perfect, but he was definitely captured because of other accounts in Lauderdale County. And in his story, he talks about a little bit about his capture in Lauderdale County. Probably the thing that, that is very factual, other than the fact he embellished it, is he is part of the Mortal 600. He gets sent to Charleston, where those 600 Confederate soldiers were under gunfire from uh, Southern forces because the Union felt like the Confederates had put soldiers under uh, fire from their batteries, POWs. So it was a tit-for-tat thing. The Immortal 600 was very famous throughout the South. The conditions those guys had to suffer through, you uh, know, you could, um, you could make the case it was similar to Andersonville, uh, what those guys had to go through. Fontaine does a good job of telling what occurs, but he also has to embellish things. He claims he was in a ship and it was 144 degrees. I know enough about being in a, a steamed uh, chamber in a paper mill to know 144 degrees, you ain't going to last very long. So uh, that letter uh, over here on the right, the far right, uh, he was up for exchange. And I quite, there, there, it's an interesting story here that I just haven't, researched enough to comment it on, but Fontaine basically refused the, the parole. I mean, he's actually paroled, but he refused the exchange. And there's a reason there, and it looks like maybe one of the Union soldiers had paid some, his family had paid some money to bypass the, the line, if you will, and Fontaine claims he found out about it and shut the, the exchange down. Uh -oh. And that is General Hardy asking about getting Fontaine back. So even though He's doing all this stuff, all this mistruths. He, he's known by the Confederate High Command. It's the second general that's uh, mentioned him by name. Now we'll go to the middle part of the story. This is November 1863. Uh, Sherman has just marched through this our area on his way to Chattanooga. Dodge follows him, and Dodge is tasked with rebuilding the railroad from Nashville to Chattanooga via Athens and Huntsville. This given the Union two uh, logistical supply lines into Chattanooga. And Dodge, when rebuilding the railroad, uh, he set up, if you look at those uh, blue circles, he set up bases all along the road. And, and the far north one there is Columbia, which was Fontaine's target uh, on his mission. And, and there over toward Murfreesboro, according to him, Dodge wanted to do was break up Confederate uh, conscripting parties. One of the things that happened after Chattanooga and Chickamauga is the South realized we've got to have soldiers. We don't have enough because the tactics they used uh, were very uh, detrimental to anybody's uh, state of life. The North wasn't any different. The, you know, it wasn't a very, it was a, almost an attrition war. Uh, uh, so they were in, they had, Roddy had come across the river, that's those two red lines, to conscript. Now those, the 4th Alabama, 10th Alabama Cavalry, Moreland's Cavalry Regiment, if, you know, if you got ancestors in any of those, they were all involved in coming across the river at that time to gather up soldiers. Fontaine comes back right, uh, from his mission and he's basically right into the middle of three or four Union forces moving into Lardell County to break this up. They're mounted infantry, and he's trying to dodge them. And, and so he has a hiding place. And it's on a place called uh, Hurricane Creek. And uh, the reason it was named Hurricane Creek, and you'll find it on your maps, is because according to this Union memoir, a tornado had gone through there. Uh, in early 1863. And they talk about all the trees being blown down as they make their way to the, this camp. They are tipped off to where Fontaine is 
They had found his tracks, but didn't know what he was or what was going on. But they had passed by a, a unionist family that volunteered information to them. Now, according to Fontaine, they were tipped off because he had paroled some soldiers that he had caught up in Middle Tennessee. According to Fontaine, he carried a bunch of torpedoes up there, put them under a rail line next to a tunnel not far from Murfreesboro, and had blown up a train full of soldiers from Missouri. Uh, I can't find any evidence of that occurring. However, there's a bunch of evidence about what he actually did, which is they went and made very good uh, maps of fortifications that were on the railroad, especially around Columbia. Uh, it's the kind of stuff that had gotten Sam Davis killed. Uh, when I say killed, he was hanged just a few weeks prior to this. We're talking about three weeks after Sam Davis was hung at Pulaski by Dodge. And uh, same kind of stuff. He's also got a wireless guy. Uh, when I say wireless, he's a telegraphic, uh, not wireless, a, telegra a wire guy back then. A telegraph operator that goes and taps in the line and he's stealing union signals that are going on the telegraph. He's done a bunch of good stuff. This is all from the union side. This is what they're saying. Uh, but anyway, they kept, they, they surprised uh, Fontaine's force in this hollow. These are pictures from that area. I don't know if that, I, I doubt if that's the same house. Uh, the property was owned by Colonel B.F. Chisholm, who had just been captured a, co a couple weeks before. And so they surprised him. Uh, Fontaine didn't put out pickets. And because of that, uh, the force sizes were about the same, about 35 men on both sides. And most of the Confederates got away, but they did capture Fontaine and four men. And Fontaine claims that his gun misfired. The Union account says he emptied both pistols and didn't hit anybody. <laughs> uh, so it was a quick fight. So you can kind of see here where these skirmishes took place during this time. There's a big skirmish that's fought, fought at Wayland Springs just a day or two before this where Union forces broke up a huge uh, conscripting party. There was probably 100 conscripts. They captured 35 guys there. Most of them were probably conscripts and killed five or six. Most of the captured, based on my research, were, were, uh, took the oath. You know, they probably just, as soon as the fighting started, they probably went over north. They didn't want to be fighting anyway. Only Fontaine, uh, you know, like I said, only Fontaine and five of his party captured Hurricane Creek. Uh, the big thing here is the fact that this is, there's so many people captured in Lauderdale County during the months of November and December. It's just really amazing how many soldiers were counted. And in trying to figure out whether they're conscripts or, or uh, soldiers that are just staying at home. And we'll kind of analyze that a little bit when we go forward because, well, before we get there, Fontaine's capture was a big deal to the Union forces. And here's the, here's the communication from Dodge to Grant about capturing Fontaine. And then in General Thomas's report, he specifically mentions the capture of Fontaine. Now, it's rare to see this kind of stuff in the official records or people's reports. I mean, they, they really make a big deal about this. So now we'll go talk a little bit about the third part of this. What's the tombstone? And I'm interested in this. And the reason I'm interested in this, this is my family, my ancestors. And so this is it's an interesting thing to me to find all this information associated with a burial and this, this tombstone is George T. Fields. He, he died on January 2nd, 1864. There's only, it's only two weeks afterwards. And I always assumed he died of disease or an illness. I mean, that makes sense. A lot of people during that time died of those things. He had just turned 17 years old. He had just, for, the, for two months now, he's eligible for, to be conscripted. Uh, but this isn't the Fields Family Cemetery. This is the Burroughs family cemetery. And the Burroughs was a unionist family. They are in the Southern Claims record and they talk about being part of the, uh, for the union and how they describe extensively how they helped the union during the Civil War, either by giving them, furnishing them uh, supplies that they wanted returns to. 
But the skirmish is just just a few miles. It's just this cemetery is just a few miles from where that skirmish was. In the cemetery, so southeast of the uh, southwest of the, uh, I'm sorry, the the skirmish is northwest of the cemetery, about a couple miles. The Fields family home was two miles to the northeast. And if you go a couple, three miles further northeast from the Fields home, you reach the burial ground for the Fields family. So he's not buried with the rest of the Fields, which is kind of amazing. He's buried at Second Creek Cemetery. Some of you guys like Brian over there uh, know where that is. John Burroughs, who, who was the patriarch of the family uh, that owned the property, was 54 years year old. And according to him, he had sons in the Confederate Army, but he talked them out of fighting. And he also had two da daughters that were around George's age. So there's the baseline. Let's see where that takes us. Well, the first thing we're going to talk about is this guy. This guy's name is Ward McDonald. He's the captain of the 4th Alabama Cavalry. And he wrote a memoir that was published in the Moulton paper. Two whole chapters of his memoir don't discuss anything about doing nothing but capturing uh, draft evaders, conscripting people, and how difficult that was and how awful that, that duty was. So, and the reason I say that is because there was a lot of that that went on. Or he wouldn't have wrote about it. He, he, I found him in several skirmishes with Roddy's cavalry being mentioned, but he don't mention that in this book. But he does talk about the conscripted. The guy on the left there is George's older brother. He, he enlisted in the Confederate Army the year before in 1862 at the age of 18. His name was Solomon Fields. He was in Captain Lester's company of the 7th Alabama Cavalry. That's Captain Lester on the right. He's captured on December 14th, the same day Lamar Fontaine's captured. Is he one of the soldiers that was with Lamar Fontaine? Was he one of these soldiers that was with uh, the uh, fight over near Wayland Springs or one of these other skirmishes? Or was he just captured at home? He had turned 18 years old when he enlisted, like I said earlier, but records show that he had deserted from the army at Tullahoma a couple months earlier, just right after uh, they had a major battle, cavalry battle there. It was a part of the Tullahoma campaign, and his regiment suffered severely in that engagement. So the question is, is well, why did he do that? And this next slide kind of maybe explains that. This is Solomon Fields' POW cards. It shows that he's not in the 7th or 9th Alabama Cavalry, because the 9th Alabama Cavalry is what the 7th became. It shows that he's in Foster's Battalion of Cavalry. Now, it took me a long time to figure out Foster's Battalion of Cavalry, but there's a major, Frank Foster, who was given a job by the governor of Alabama to form a new battalion of cavalry, and it occurred right before this event. And one of the carrots that you see Roddy's command offer all during the war is to soldiers that were from Colbert and Lauderdale counties to come back and they could be part of cavalry regiments here and not have to fight with the main army. And so there was a lot of soldiers that came back and did that. And I imagine that's what Solomon Fields was doing. And these, these uh, Foster wasn't around though because he'd been captured just a few weeks earlier uh, on uh, Halloween, he was part of that group that was captured at the Chisholm home that's in the Booger Saga. Was George and Saul? You know, I mean, George could have been conscripted he could have, or he could have enlisted. He could have been just like his brother and they're part of the same battalion. Were they together? But, but the card shows one interesting thing. It says that Saul Fields was captured by the 50th Illinois, I mean, of uh, uh, 7th Illinois Mounted Infantry, whereas Fontaine was captured by the 50th Illinois. Now, they were working in, together, but it is different. And the 7th Illinois had an interesting story. That, uh, they said on their way back to Lexington after the skirmish at uh, Wayland Springs, they ran into a, a house where a Unionist female had shot one soldier, killing him, and took the other one prisoner. 
it, when she had seen them coming up the road because they had made her fix their dinner. I thought that was an interesting story. And John Burrow, in his Southern claim, says he gave a mule to Union forces so that they could mount a field's neighbor who had been captured by the Yankees. So all this stuff is just weird how this ties in, right? Uh, to, to finish it up a little bit on Solomon Fields, uh, after about a year of prison life, he ends up deciding that he's had enough of prison life and he's going to become a galvanized Yankee. His uh, neighbor, a guy named Aaron Newton, who had been captured two times, the, second, the first at Fort Donaldson, the second at, uh, after being exchanged, the second time was at uh, Missionary Ridge. He joins uh, that third U.S. Infantry, volunteer infantry also. And they go out west. Uh, Aaron didn't make it. He died of cholera there. Saul ended up coming back to, after the war, came back to Lardell County. He never had any children. Uh, he was married twice, but he went to Texas and uh, became a big rancher. Another thought, because these are kind of speculations, but we're tying fact to speculation, because you can't have speculation without facts, unless you're Lamar Fontaine. <laughs> this is Cynthia Fields on the right, and there is a document that was, somebody wrote at the time of the Civil War and made it into the history of Lexington. And the item number two on there says uh, basically a turkey uh, was taken from Cynthia Fields by the feds. She chased them to the Lexington Loretta Road and got her turkey back. They gave her a quarter for it. So, or, the, or they gave her a quarter. In other words, they didn't shoot her. I don't know what that meant, but I think they gave her the money. George could have been upset. He could have decided he was going to take matters in his own hands and he could have been a bushwhacker because there was a lot of kids that became bushwhackers during the Civil War and he could have decided he was going to take pot shots. Well, if he was taking pot shots, guys like these two guys didn't appreciate it. You know, I found in General Dodge's record he was tired of people who his soldiers thought were bushwhackers and they would come and they would have a trial and they would get released. So it demoralized his soldiers because they knew the guy had done it, but they, they didn't have proof a judge would let them off. Dodge said stop, basically told them stop doing it. You have a drumhead court martial there. And what you notice from about the middle of 63 to the end of the war, there's not a lot of bring backs. There's a lot of people who get shot. Uh, this guy, on the right, his name is Colonel Edward Anderson. He is the, uh, of the 12th Indiana Cavalry. He was not in Lardell County, but I think he's a good example of the excess of this. He was on his 30th victim, according to his own notes from uh, information that I got, of where they had taken gorillas and executed them. And on the 30th one, uh, where he had a 17-year-old boy say that he would not join up with the Union forces and he was not going to join up with the Confederates, he was going to try to stay neutral, he wasn't fighting. Uh, near Brownsboro, Alabama, just on the other side of Huntsville, they took him out and killed him. And then his mother came forward, found out about it, and I believe there was a lieutenant, based on this newspaper article, in his command that didn't think it was the right thing and he turned evidence on him. The guy was court-martialed and he was released. Actually tried to commit suicide. Anyway, that's another interesting story. So, so what happened to 17-year-old George Field? Did he die of natural causes? Family feud with the Burroughs family? Exposure from evading conscripting Confederates. I forgot to mention January 2nd was, according to the 50th Illinois, was the coldest night of the war, the night of the first and the second. Uh, mortally wounded in a skirmish as a recently conscripted soldier, perhaps with his brother at his side. Mortally wounded, killed, or in the field execution, acting as a bushwhacker. I ain't never going to find that out. But it's amazing that I found out this much, to me, because most people don't. So, so there he is, Lamar Fontaine. What he led me to, how about that?